Welcome, everyone. I am Chris Sumrick, Executive Director of Humanities Nebraska, and glad that you're joining us today for what uh, promises to be another uh, remarkable conversation about um, our voting rights and the civil rights movement. Um, this is part of Humanities Nebraska's uh, program series called Valuing the Vote. And that has come out of a uh, nationwide initiative funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation um, called Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation. And that is administered through the Federation of State Humanities Councils and uh, more than 40 humanities councils all across the nation are doing a variety of programming under that initiative. And here in Nebraska, we chose the theme of valuing the vote uh, to discuss um, with Nebraskans um, how that right to vote, cast our vote has been expanded over the years and over our country's history and often through um, difficult times. And it continues to require our watchfulness and our participation as citizens. Um, it's part of our duty as citizens and the strong, for a strong democracy to be civically engaged. Um, and this is the second program today in a multi-part series on civil and voting rights acts in the 1960s. Um, looking at the passage of the Voting Rights Act uh, 1965. Um, you might remember in November, we did a series on women's suffrage issues that was also really interesting. So a, a few days ago, we had a program with the Blackman sisters in Alabama who were really just um, had amazing stories to share. And so today I'm gonna introduce to you the same moderator for the programs as we had the other day and, and also a couple of special guests from Mississippi. Um, so our moderator will be Willie Barney from Omaha. Uh, he is um, the founder and CEO for the Empowerment Network, which was launched in 2006 to unite and transform Omaha into a great city, uh, thriving and prosperous, and uh, in every zip code and neighborhood. He is also president of a national consulting firm called WDB Resultants and co-publisher of Revive Omaha. Uh, he and his wife Yolanda own several businesses uh, and facilitate collaborative community building efforts in Omaha and around the United States. Um, Willie will be in conversation with two guests joining us um, from Mississippi, actually one in Jacksonville, Florida nearby and one in Mississippi. Um, and um, Mr. Charlie Cobb is, is the gentleman who is currently in Jacksonville, and he can explain more about his connections to Mississippi. He was field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, SNCC, and a leader of Freedom Summer, the 1964 voter registration drive aimed at increasing the number of registered Black voters in Mississippi. Um, and then our other guest will be Dr. Leslie McLemore, a civil rights activist and a Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party delegate who went to the 1964 convention. We're very honored to have them join us and we'll let them tell more of their stories. Uh, but Mr. Barney, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we were hoping that we would be warmer than we were last week, but I'm not sure that's the case. <laughs> Uh, so great to see uh, Mr. Cobb and uh, Dr. McLemore. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Chris and Humanities Nebraska for this opportunity. Uh, we are looking forward to this conversation and learning more about you and, and definitely want to get into the journey. But I wanted to make sure that you both knew I am from the Delta of Mississippi. First seven years of my life. Arcola, Hollandale, Greenville, Mississippi. Oh, yeah. Washington the, County. Oh, yes. Washington <laughs> County. So I know you all have some experience down that direction. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the program. Uh, we at towards the end, we'll have some uh, audience questions and some interaction, but I uh, want to just jump into it. And one of the ways I want to start out, um, uh, Mr. Cobb, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, how you got involved in the civil rights movement and the voting rights movement uh, in Mississippi and tell us a little bit about that. There are two distinct but related parts to that story. Uh, one, uh, uh, as a student at Howard University, in 1961, I became involved in the sit-in movement. I think like a lot of people, a lot of young black people across the South, uh, when the sit-ins erupted in Greensboro, North Carolina, they caught our attention because they were people our age. And in a lot of ways for the first time, it, we realized that uh, uh, civil rights was something young people could do. Before the sit-ins, I would argue, uh, civil rights was more thought of as something grown-ups did. 
and what you got seeing, or say John Lewis or Julian Bond or Diane Nash, were people our age engaged in civil rights struggle. So it engaged us and I became involved in that movement. And because I was involved in that movement, uh, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, uh, invited me to a, a workshop or a conference for young activists in Houston, Texas. And they gave me money for a bus ticket because uh, you didn't fly to places in those days. Uh, and I bought a bus ticket uh, that took me through the whole South uh, from Washington, D.C., uh, Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, uh, and uh, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, and on into Texas. And when the bus got to Mississippi, I got off the bus because the students there were sitting in. And I thought it was one thing for me to be sitting in, say, as a Howard student in Maryland and Virginia. It was something qualitatively different for students in Mississippi to be sitting in. Because from my vantage point, uh, and remember, I had grown up in DC where I was born and in Massachusetts where I went to high school. Uh, Mississippi was where Emmett Till was killed. Yes. And that was the, our whole sense of Mississippi was that. Wow. Uh, and wow. we, it was hard for me to imagine students sitting in in that place. So I wanted to meet them and I got off the bus and made my way to their headquarters. I, I tell this story sometimes and say, these Mississippians kidnapped me because <laughs> I, I made my way to their headquarters I had no intention of staying in Mississippi, uh, although I was aware of SNCC. Uh, and I introduced myself to them. And one of these students who had just finished Tugulu, Giat Leslie, <laughs> uh, <laughs> got up off his seat when I, when I finished this explanation. And Giat's a big guy. He would later become chair of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And he kind of hovered over me with complete disdain and got right up in my face, and Giat was about six feet, I guess, burly, he said, and I remember the words exactly. It's 1962, the summer, spring of 62, and he looks at me and he says, you're going to Texas for a workshop on civil rights? What's the point of doing that when you're standing right here in Mississippi? <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I kind of got the message. <laughs> you can go off to Texas and chatter about civil rights if you want to, wow. but we're wow. doing stuff here. Mm -hmm. And for me, school had finished, so <laughs> I had not thought about staying in Mississippi, but uh, given that challenge, and that's what I saw it as, he was yeah. challenged me as to whether I was really serious about my interest in civil rights in Mississippi. Right. And they had just started a project up in Greenwood, Mississippi. Greenwood. Uh, yes, and Greenwood. I, well, I, and I went up to the Delta with them and eventually uh, uh, stayed up in the Delta in Sunflower County, kind of next door oh, to, yeah. to, right. to, to Greenwood. That's right. uh, and I said, well, summer or the beginning of summer, I don't really have to go to a conference in Texas uh, and uh, I can see what these guys are up to. Well, at the end of summer, I found, I hadn't realized this in deciding to stay for what I thought would be the summer, but you can't at the end of the summer, having now involved people in what you're doing around voter registration, uh, then kind of say, well, it's been interesting folks, but I have to register for classes. <laughs> I'm not made up that way and I was sort of, <laughs> didn't feel I could leave. And I wound up staying for four or five years uh, in Mississippi as a SNCC uh, field secretary. So that's sort of, there's lots of other components to this story, but I, I won't, given the time limitations, won't dwell on this. I would like to say one thing the story does reflect though, and I think it's an important dimension of the movement that's missed is that as important as the challenges to white supremacy and discrimination and racism and racial segregation were within the movement, the more important challenge 
that unfolded and that you can see if you really look at the movement is the challenges that black people made to one another within the black community because that's a lot of what was going on black people were challenging other black people to essentially as Giat challenged me do something or well, what are you going to do and that's, that's the real that's point of that story i'd like to make so are you going to texas to read about it or are you going to <laughs> yeah, or stay Shatter, here and, you know Duke, right <laughs> and that's giat's hover and you have to understand giat was a big guy i right. weighed 135 pounds at that time and i was 19 years old <laughs> wow i want to come back to you uh <laughs> so, uh, and, and i want to come back to that and, and continue that story I want to give a chance uh, to Dr. Uh, McLemore. Uh, we want to, so first of all, welcome to both of you. Uh, Dr. McLemore, can you tell us how you uh, joined into this journey of civil rights and, and voting rights? Uh, yes, I am uh, speaking from my hometown of Walls, Mississippi, where I grew up. Yes. And I graduated uh, from high school in 1960. <clears throat> During my senior year, in high school in Walls. Walls is on Highway 61. Uh, yeah. Walls is about 100 miles north of where you grew up, where you were born. Yeah. Uh, Walls is the first little town in the Mississippi Delta coming out of Memphis. Yeah. So I live 50, uh, 59 miles north of Clarksdale. And Clarksdale is also where they have the Delta Blues Museum. But uh, in high school, I was president of the student council. And I called, uh, we had a boycott of classes at my brand new high school in Walls in DeSoto County. And as president of the student council, uh, we were assigned four faculty members to uh, be faculty advisors. This was 1959-60 school year. And the principal was concerned that we would maybe demonstrate or try to do too much in the town of Walls. Now understand that the town of Walls consisted of uh, two cotton gins, three stores, and a post office. So we had nothing to integrate. We had nothing to protest around, but the principal didn't want us demonstrating in any form or fashion. Now Walls is close to Memphis, so they figured that maybe we had been influenced by what was going on in Memphis in 59 and 60, because there was some civil rights activity in Memphis at that time. But so, uh, I led the boycott of classes because of the too many faculty members on the student council as advisors. It was a brand new school. We didn't have uh, nothing in the, uh, in the chem lab or the biology lab. Uh, we protested because we didn't have any Negro history books in the library. And then the third reason we protested was because we didn't like the food in the cafeteria. Uh, the cornbread was not quite thick enough or it was too thin or the chicken was too greasy, but there was some reason. But anyway, I went off to Rush College in Holly Springs, Mississippi in the fall of 1960. And parenthetically, I led a boycott at Rust too on one or two occasions. And one of the reasons was over the food at Rust. And on reflection, the food at the Delta Southern High School was much better than the food at Rush College. So. <laughs> I really should have uh, gone back and apologized to the principal <laughs> and told him, Mr. Johnson, the food is great at Delta Center, but it is really horrible here at Russ College. And you but, sent some of that down to us, right? <laughs> 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 so, 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 you know, I had this great pleasure of going off to college in 1960. So I was in college between 1960 and 1964. And that really was the height of uh, the civil rights activity. The most intensive aspect of the civil rights movement occurred in Mississippi between 1960 and 1964. So I was involved in all of the great campaigns, although I was in North Mississippi, uh, where uh, we didn't have the exposure that some of the students had in, in, in Southern Mississippi or Central Mississippi. But I got involved in the uh, NAACP, got involved in voter registration. And, and in 1961, we started a voter registration campaign in Hollis Springs, which is where Rust College is located. But when I went off to Rust in 1960, 
the first activity was boycotting the local theater, the movie theater in downtown Holly Springs. And the uh, blacks were required to sit in the, uh, in the balcony. And of course, whites could sit on the floor of the, of the theater. So we boycotted that theater. So that was really my first civil rights action once I uh, got to college. And I was uh, very much involved in campus activities. Uh, I am one of these persons who uh, early on decided that being in public life was important. So I was freshman class president at Rust. And because I was freshman class president, I was invited to be a part of the leadership council. So that's how I got involved in the, in the theater boycott uh, and then other activities on the campus. But we started uh, trying to get uh, blacks registered to vote in Holly Springs in 1961. And that was the first time in the history of Marshall County where we were located, where black folk were actively above ground activities, getting black folk going door to door, trying to get people registered to vote. Now, uh, the local NAACP chapter had started in Holly Springs around 1953, and it resurfaced again in 1957. And when I came to Rust in 1960, there was an ongoing chapter of the NAACP in Holly Springs. And two years later, we formed the first college chapter of the NAACP on the campus at Rust. And by that time, I was sophomore uh, class president, and I was also elected as the first president of the college chapter of the NAACP. And that was when I first met, uh, during that period, I met uh, Aaron Henry, Dr. Aaron Henry at that time was, by that time, was president of the statewide NAACP and his cohort and friend and buddy was Meg Evers. And Meg Evers came to Rust College in 1962 to install us as the officers of the NAACP. So I got involved in the NAACP in 1962, Bob Moses, uh, I think that Charlie mentioned earlier, who was head of SNCC in Mississippi. He was director of SNCC in Mississippi, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And Bob came to Holly Springs. And so we got involved in both SNCC and in the NAACP. And it was not until the summer of 1964 that I actually became a paid SNCC field secretary. Uh, unlike Charlie, I didn't, I didn't drop out of college. I, I was... I was, I was in college full time and I stayed in college. I remained in college and went to graduate school. That's a story later on. But my involvement started with my 1960 involvement, got involved in voter registration, got involved in a political campaign when our local college chap chaplain ran for the US Congress in 1962. And then in 1963, the following winter, I met Fannie Lou Hamer on a trip from Bolivar County, Mississippi to Georgia. And Fannie Lou Hamer had been evicted from the Marlow Plantation in Sunflower County uh, less than a year And when I met Mrs. Hamer. So I got involved in SNCC, got involved in the NAACP, got involved in the Freedom Democratic Party, got involved in the Freedom Vote Campaign. So I was involved in all of the major activities and was uh, a founding member of the Temporary Executive Committee for the Freedom Democratic Party, and then became a, a member of the Permanent Executive Committee. And in 1964, I was, I was elected Vice Chair of the Freedom Democratic Party, although I didn't participate in any activities beyond 1964, I was elected Vice Chair, but I went off to graduate school in 1964, but uh, that's sort of my story, primarily working in North Mississippi, but involved in both the NAACP and SNCC, but I was always a full-time student at Rush College. Thank you, Dr. McLemore. This is really powerful, and um, I want to switch gears a bit um, as we were building on both of how you both uh, became involved. Um, and I was, we were joking about the food and some of the other things and the challenge inside the community. But I think if we can reflect and maybe take us back for a moment, because you have mentioned Fannie Lou Hamer, you've mentioned Emmett Till, Edgar, Edgar, Edgar. it's amazing 
who you're talking about, because when we look at the context of the civil rights movement, those are names that just have uh, traveled with us over time. Can you give us a, a couple minutes each, uh, coming back to you, Mr. Cobb, you said you were riding a bus across the deep south and Dr. McLemore, you're, you're protesting in the midst of Mississippi during this time. Can you take us back to what the environment, what it was really like to live through those moments in Mississippi at that time? Uh, yes, I can, I, you know, I was born in Walls, Mississippi, as I pointed out to you, small town. My, my grandfather, Leslie Williams, was, a, was one of two black landowners in the town of Walls. And uh, he was uh, sort of the local, one of the local leaders for the Negroes in the town. So. I, I had this sense of uh, what leadership was about because my grandfather would help get people out of jail, take them to the doctor. He was also in real estate. So he owned land both in Walls and in Memphis. So, you know, the county line, city limits were close by. So I spent time between Walls and Memphis, but my grandfather was a business owner. So he, he had some, some clout in the town, in the black community. And, but when I got involved in the civil rights movement, it scared my mother to death. When I went off to Holly Springs and Russ and got involved and I was telling her about my involvement. Now, understand, my mother was a, uh, was a no-nonsense Black woman uh, in the 50s and 60s because we grew up in this small town. So my, my mother grew up with a lot of uh, the white folk who were her contemporaries. So she didn't take any stuff from anybody, but you know, she held her ground. But when yeah. I got involved in the movement, she was concerned about my safety. She was right. concerned that I was going to get killed. And my grandfather was too. But, but my grandfather's notion was this. He said, uh, as long as you're involved, you're doing something, trying to uplift the race. Uh, and if you get in jail, I'm going to get you out. And uh, you know, yeah. you be careful. But, but you do what you have to do now. So, but, but my mother was getting a threatening phone call. And pe mm. People were calling and threatening and because my name appeared in the commercial appeal, the local Memphis newspaper a couple yes. times. So, it, so white people knew I was involved. And so they were telling her uh, and saying to her, you know, uh, your boy shouldn't be doing what he's doing. But, you know, it scared her, but my grandfather was much stronger. He said, Keep on doing what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. But, but, but it was very fearful. Now, I, I want you to understand that in Holly Springs, Mississippi, in 1961, a group of students from Russ College were going door to door, knocking on doors, trying to get Black people to register to vote. And this hadn't been done yeah. before. This had not been done before. The NAACP chapter primarily was an underground chapter of the NAACP. But by 1960, S.T. Nero, who was the advisor for us, a former school teacher uh, in Marshall County in Georgia, worked yes. with us as an informal advisor. But it was very dangerous, you know? So we were using the cars yeah. of some of the faculty members to take people to the Marshall County Courthouse to register to vote. And what the good white folk did in Holly Springs they wrote down the tag numbers of the cars wow. of the faculty wow. members. So wow. the faculty members were getting threatening phone calls, but because they were teaching at Russ College, which was independent, private, it was not a state-supported school, they couldn't take their jobs. But on the other hand, they were threatened because of their involvement through us. So we were using their vehicles to take people to the county courthouse. But, I, but, but you know, it was a dangerous time. Yes. But I, but indeed, we had the safe haven of being on the campus at Russ College, and that right. worked our benefit. Thank you, Dr. I, Michael Moore. And I want to jump over to you, Mr. Cobb, you know, just echoing in, share with us your, your perspective of that time. Sure. I, well, what I'm going to do is actually read you an excerpt, excerpt from another SNCC field secretary which I think captures the time in the period. I think people don't understand the level of intimidation and violence that unfolded against people who were actively trying to gain uh, the right to vote. I think it's 
almost too alien, I guess, for people today to understand, you know, assassinations and church bombings and economic reprisals and all of this just around the getting the right to vote. So the person I want to introduce you to, when I speak and write, uh, I always like to introduce readers or an audience to people who are absent from the canon, but who I think are important to understanding the movement and the movement dynamics. So I want to I want to uh, read an excerpt from a 1962 report from Sam Block. Now, Sam, Sam was the first of us, meaning the first of us who were young, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, who began working around voter registration uh, in the Delta. And, uh, and that's not to, to dismiss the earlier work of NACP leaders and the like. Uh, but Sam was the first of us young people. And he was a native Mississippian from Cleveland, Mississippi. And as for, and here's a report on the first time he brought people to the county courthouse to try and register to vote in LaFleur County, the county seat of, 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 of LaFleur County. Greenwood is the county seat of LaFleur County. And I want to apologize in advance because in Sam's report, the N word is used as we say in polite society. But I think on hearing this excerpt, you'll understand why. But nonetheless, for if it makes some people uncomfortable, I, I apologize in advance. Now here's Sam. We went up to register and it was the first time visiting the courthouse in Greenwood, Mississippi. And the sheriff came up to me and he asked me, he said, nigga, where are you from? I told him, well, I'm a native Mississippian. He said, yeah, yeah, I know that. But where are you from? I don't know where you from. I said, well, around some counties. He said, well, I know that. But I know you ain't from here because I know every nigger and his mammy. I said, you know all the niggers. Do you know any colored people? He got angry. He spat in my face and he walked away. Then he came back and turned around and told me, I don't want to see you in town anymore. The best thing you better do is pack your clothes and get out and don't never come back no more. I said, well, sure. If you don't want to see me here, I think the best thing for you to do is pack your clothes and leave. Get out of town because I'm here to stay. I came here to do a job and this is my intention. I'm going to stay and do this job. Sam was 22 years old. And I think this little encounter on the steps of the LaFleur County Courthouse tells you almost everything you need to know about civil rights struggle in Mississippi because other people followed Sam. We had a movement, but it's the courage yes. I want you to see in this passage. You want to understand what made the movement? Despite all the resistance from white power and white supremacists, it was the deep, deep wells of courage in Mississippi, particularly in rural Mississippi. That's Fannie Lou Hamer's story. That's you need a Blackwell story, Amzie Moore story, Aaron Henry story, and a whole list of names. Uh, I, I, I think people don't understand uh, the, the level of hostility. And in a lot of my writing, I try and push that for it wasn't Charlie Cobb from, from Washington, DC <laughs> that freed Mississippi some kind of way. It was these people who we didn't even know, at least I didn't as a 19 year old, Mississippi was entirely defined, in my mind, by what happened to Emmett Till. It didn't occur to me that there were these Fannie Lou Hamers. One, for instance, take E.W. Steptoe, who was one of the first black men, and they were all, almost always, the ages of our parents or grandparents. Yes. 
So E.W. Steptoe down in Amit County, maybe the, the most Klan ridden county in the, in, the, in the state formed an NACP branch in 1953. And didn't take long for this. And this is notoriously one of the most Klan ridden counties in Mississippi. And word got out that he had done this. So during an NACP meeting, the sheriff walks in with a whole posse of white men and they seize the membership list of the Amit County NACP. Well, as you can imagine, uh, the membership numbers dropped way down. Uh, well, EW, as we most often call them, or Mr. Steptoe, <laughs> personally bought enough NAACP memberships to have a legitimate NAACP branch. I don't know. I tried to ask him about this one. Did you make up names or, or what? Because the people in New York have no way of knowing whether these are real people or not. They just got the membership money. Yeah. And he never quite answered that question yeah. uh, to me. But to me, it illustrates, you know, the kind of, for me, I'm, Leslie's is from Mississippi. I'm a kid from Massachusetts and Washington, D.C. So all this courage yes. was unexpected. It was not something I was expecting to see. And, and that really has to this day stamped my thinking about Mississippi and I think is what powered the movement in uh, Mississippi. Mr. Cobb, I appreciate, uh, and Dr. McLemore, I appreciate you both sharing that because uh, to listen and to read about it, uh, but to, to hear from you what it was really like in the midst of that, the, the intimidation, uh, the uh, threats, the, the reality of what you were facing, even at a young age, but still that courage and faith to keep pressing forward. And so we have voting rights. We have uh, more educated than we've ever been. You know, we, we have something, we have more people, uh, African-American politicians and at any time, I believe in the history of the country. And so uh, your work and the courage to keep pressing forward um, has generated some very positive outcomes that we all stand on. I wanted to ask you two additional questions and then we're gonna move into some questions hopefully from uh, the, the audience. Um, I wanna hear from you, how did that time and that era impact and influence what you're doing right now here today? Uh, well, you know, I, po I pointed out earlier that I started out with sort of an interest in public life because I was freshman class president in high school uh, and, and through high school, I was either class president or student government president, <clears throat> excuse me. In college, I followed the same pattern. I was either uh, a class president or student government president. So at Rush College, I was president of my class, a class the first three years and my the fourth year I was president of student government. So I followed that basic pattern. But also the, the story of Sam Block that uh, Charlie just read, uh, along with Sam Block uh, during that time was a young man by the name of Willie Peacock, who mm -hmm. was a Rush College graduate. He was in Greenwood with Sam Block, came to Greenwood soon after Sam Block got there. And uh, you know, a true to life story in 1961. Now understand that SNCC came to Mississippi in 61 with the Macomb Project. I, I, want, I want your audience to understand that I went to college in 1960. So we were engaging in protest and voter registration activities before SNCC came to town. So in 1961, when I was taking people to the county courthouse in Marshall County, Mississippi, uh, the sheriff, Flick, uh, Flick Ash, stood in the, uh, in the, in the courthouse door and, and I had five people standing behind me. He told me not to come into the courthouse. This was the county sheriff, blocked the door and we had a conversation, but I indicated to him that we had a right to register and vote. So, so we got people in, of course they, they attempted to register, didn't get voted, but, but, but that happened just on several different occasions. Uh, at that point in my life, I was 21 years old and I had just a gray spot of hair in the front. 
uh, I, I, I was prematurely gray. My, my, my father was prematurely gray. His father was prematurely gray. So by the time I got out of graduate school, I had almost as much gray hair as I have now. So I've been gray headed for a long time. So it had nothing to do with being in the movement, scared to death. I just simply was gray headed <laughs> because of my, my biology. Okay, but now, uh, so I, uh, once I graduated from college, went to graduate school and I moved to Jackson, Mississippi and was on the faculty at Jackson State for 40 years. I ran for the US Congress in 1980. It was a part of my whole idea about public service and public life. And I, and I came in second uh, and uh, this was 1980. 19 years later, I ran for the Jackson City Council. Mm -hmm. And I was on the Jackson City Council for almost 11 years. And during that period, when I was on the city council, I served as president of the council for six of my 10 years on the council. And upon the death of, of the mayor, I served as acting mayor in the city of Jackson. So I sort of followed that. When I talk to young people, I talk about leadership. And I try to explain to them that leadership is not something that happens overnight. You know, it's something that has developed over time. And clearly, starting, quite frankly, with the Walls Chapel CME Church, when I was assistant superintendent of, of Sunday school and when I was a Sunday school teacher and when I had to do these Children Day speeches and Mother's Day speeches yeah, and, right. and Easter right. speeches and all that stuff is this where, you know, you develop leadership, you know, you learn how to conduct meetings. So, so I talked to them about leadership because that has been my pattern. I am now 80 years old and I'm a member of the Walls Mississippi Board of Aldermen. And four years ago, when they reincorporated the town, two of us became the first African Americans to serve on the board of Alderman in Walls, Mississippi. Yeah. Oh. And the upcoming election is in June. So I'm now campaigning for another four years on the Walls Board of Alderman. So that gives you some idea yeah. of what I've done. So what I've tried to do is to do both the academic piece I've published you know, uh, and I've been involved in the community. I've headed up a variety of organizations. I've been, a, I was a mentor in Jackson for more than 20 years. And I'm mentoring uh, elementary students now in, in uh, Walls at the, at the school that was, was my high school is now Walls Elementary School. So I'm still yeah. mentoring, worked in the community, but, but, oh. but I set that pattern for my life years ago. And I've sort of followed that you know, with the yeah. academic piece as well as the community piece. Dr. Um, McElmore, I appreciate your, your leadership and your commitment to education and mentoring. Mr. Cobb, I want to come over to you. How has what that experience in the 50s and 60s influenced where you are today and what you continue to do through your life? Okay, uh, since uh, leaving Mississippi, I've primarily been a journalist and author, several books, I've worked for a range of, 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 of media, NPR, National Geographic Magazine. I was the first black writer they ever hired. Wow. Um, uh, and so that's been a big part of my life. And I still write, I'm working on a book now on the movement for black lives. Uh, and where the Mississippi experience has been especially important because I was a SNCC organizer who was not from Mississippi. I had to learn how to listen to people and how to speak to people because the way you speak to people in Washington DC or New York City is not the way you speak to people in the Mississippi Delta. I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn because I was often in life-threatening situations. I had to learn how to listen to people who had the ways and means of, of, of teaching me how to survive in this brand new and quite frankly, alien environment. All of that has been invaluable in my life as a journalist. Uh, because I was a foreign affairs writer, I was often in strange places that I didn't know anything about. And those things I learned how to do in Mississippi. Yes. 
equip me to be in some other land where I didn't speak the language, where I didn't know what the dynamic was or, or anything. That's been valuable. I, I lay claim to that as my education, yes. that That's Mississippi good. experience, because I never did get back to college. That's a whole nother story. Uh, <laughs> and I think uh, 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 right now, uh, the other big part in over the last decade of my post SNCC, post Miss Mississippi project, and this is in the way of a commercial, is the SNCC Legacy Project. We formed on the on the fiftieth anniversary of SNCC, a whole group of us, uh, a SNCC Legacy Project, and began a collaboration with Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, to begin to put out what we felt was real information, information that from the inside out not the top down or from the yeah. bottom up, not the top down about what we thought the movement was and what we experienced. That now exists on a site, www.sncdigital.org. And it's a wealth of information there. And um, before COVID-19, we've also spent a lot of time interacting. I spend a lot of time, and not solely because I'm writing a book about them, interacting with today's young activists. Because I see a lot of myself, my younger self, yes. in groups like Black Lives Matter or BYP 100, Dream Defenders in Florida, where I, I live. Um, now, and I'm uh, interested uh, in that, ideas. That, I'm glad you went there, I, but I want to hear both from you, uh, both of you, and I'll let you continue. Um, I wanted to ask that question after the work you've done and continue to do, what is your perspective about what we've seen uh, over the last few years, especially the last eight months with the demonstrations and marches? And, um, and so I'll hear from you first and then Dr. McLemore, but what is your perspective on, on it? And, and quickly, what would you share with that group? Uh, keep, keep going. They're at the point where we were all those years back are struggling with the question of how do you, where do we go from here? How we can see the necessity for organizing, or we can see that while protest is necessary, it's not sufficient. And we have to organize. This struggle is going to be a long struggle. Uh, so how do we organize? They're grappling with that question. Those are the questions they ask me the most about. Uh, and I can only partially help because organizing in Sunflower County, Mississippi or Washington County, Mississippi uh, is not the same in many ways uh, as organizing on the west side of Chicago or south central Los Angeles right, or right. Baltimore or any of these urban complex communities far more complex than anything we were over. Some of the principles are the same. You have to figure out how to talk to people. You have to figure out how you're gonna, there is a community life in these communities. So how do you navigate that life? That's what I had to deal with too in Mississippi. But 2021 is not 1961 if you're trying to have a conversation, but they are open to it. I found I, the, the one thing I have found in my interactions with today's young activists who I actively support is that as long as they don't feel you're insulting them, they are open to trying to learn from your experience. And I consider that healthy, yes. progressive, and hopeful insofar as the future is concerned. Uh, Mr. Cobb, I want to come back to you in just a moment. Uh, I want to invite our audience, um, if there are questions that you have, please go ahead and post those um, in the uh, Facebook area and in the, in the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can, and we'll buy, uh, maybe have a lightning round with Mr. Cobb and Dr. McLemore um, around a couple of things. But uh, Dr. McLemore, I want to give you a couple minutes to speak to the current environment, your perspective of it, and anything that you would say to this generation that's moving through now. Yeah, I was uh, speaking to a group just uh, uh, through Zoom uh, last week, and that's this very same question came up actually, and uh, and, and Charlie hit on 
I really, I think most of the major points, but the, uh, the lessons learned uh, is in fact, the, the organizing principle. Uh, what the Black Lives Matter people have done, they have taken a page out of uh, the notebook of all of us who were basically organized in the, in, in the 60s, organizing in the 60s. Uh, it, it, one of the things that they have done uh, very well if we think and reflect on Freedom Summer back in 1964, and we haven't really talked uh, any about that, but clearly uh, that was an interracial organizing effort. I mean, we had more white volunteers that come to Mississippi in 1964 than, than black volunteers, although they were coming to a principally a black state. Uh, but uh, the current group of organizers, you know, this is the most interracial uh, organizing effort in the history of the country. And it's had uh, not only nationwide impact, but worldwide impact. So the, the, the organizing skills that we demonstrated in the 60s, they have taken those to a new level. And, and uh, clearly the, 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 the major difference is that they have the technology that we did not have back in, in the 1960s. Uh, with, with the flip of the phone, uh, they can organize a gathering on the corner of any other place in a matter of minutes. Uh, I did some, uh, some advanced work for the Freedom Democratic Party in Atlantic City, New Jersey in 1964. I was working out of the Washington office with Ella Baker and Frank Smith and Elna Holmes Norton and Walter Tillo. And I would go to Atlantic City uh, to make preparations for the coming of Ms. Baker or Ms. Hamer, who were going to speak prior to the convention. And I, and I was working with the local chapter of the NAACP. I had to knock on doors, uh, develop flyers, get people going from speak to speak. If I had the technology, you know, then what we have now, I could have organized many more gatherings, could have organized them much more quickly and would have not had as many holes in my shoes because I was walking the streets doing that. So right. Uh, right. clearly uh, the things that we did in the 60s, the wise young people now have learned and have picked up on some of those things. And the organizing aspect of it, I think is the most profound element in terms of as, as they move forward. I mean, they've developed issues that are important issues today, but if you can do the organizing and you have two or three basic issues in, in mind that you're working with, and they have been able to use those issues to bring enlightenment to what is going on in the country. And I think one of the most promising aspects of out of all this craziness that we are part of now is, is the new generation of young people that are committed to bringing about change in our society. And, and, and these young people, clearly, I will applaud until you know my dying day. I appreciate what your, both of your perspective and, and that uh, there, there are new tools that are available the importance of having strategy. You, you mentioned two or three specific goals that you're looking to achieve, you know, uh, and building beyond what is your model, you know, those things that, that you just mentioned. Uh, there's a few questions that are, are very quick questions, I think, that came up from the audience. One is, uh, Mr. Cobb, it sounded like someone is from your home state, wanted to know what high school you went to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> but what I was really, I, I, I lived in Springfield, Massachusetts, and I went to classical high school college prep school, public school. Uh -huh. It no longer exists. At the site, there's now classical condominiums. Some sign <laughs> of change, perhaps. Well, you, <laughs> and you then if you buy that. a condominium there, you get in every apartment a piece of the old high school, a wow. blackboard, a desk, or something like that. You, you just introduced a whole nother topic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I really want to, may, may I follow up right quick on Charlie? <laughs> Uh, I went to graduate school for the second time at the University of Massachusetts. Oh, and yeah, right up the road from me. Then Amherst is close to Springfield. Yeah. This is a true story. <laughs> I, was in, I was in the Black Barber Shop in Springfield, Massachusetts in the fall of 1966. And, and we were talking. And in that barber shop was a guy by the name of Charlie Cobb Sr. Yeah, so my I father. Was Charlie Cobb's <laughs> father in the barber shop. In, in Springfield, Massachusetts, I told him that I knew his son that we had to work the snake together. And we, 
It's a glorious conversation. So I got I got to know Charlie's father through the barbershop in Springfield. <laughs> that's the purpose. Uh, of the see, see, that's, right, the barbershop. Right. That's how yeah. I was just gonna say. You, you never know what's gonna happen when you go into that barbershop. That, that's, that's a whole right. other. That's a whole other sh uh, show and segment. Right. We're talking about the barbershop. Uh, Miss, uh, Dr. McLemore, there's a question. Uh, before I get into that, uh, there's a person in the audience asking about, uh, they're from Shreveport, I think this is Mr. Uh, Hicks, uh, wondering about uh, Dr. Cuthbert Simpkins and Dave Dennis, that either one of you uh, recognize I stay in, them? I stay in touch with Dave all the time. Dave lives up the road from me in wow. South Carolina, and it's an easy drive. Before the COVID, we would go meet each other and, and wow. drink wine and eat food in, in Charleston, okay. uh, uh, and the others wow. are neat. I know, but I I don't know them. Dave and I are pretty close. Wow. Uh, uh, up and all that. Wow. Of course, uh, Dave I know from you know from the civil rights movement from SNCC, and I saw David, uh, Dave and Jackson, uh, maybe about a year ago. Uh, Dave Dave has a son, uh, Dave Dennis Jr. His yeah. son is a writer. I have a son, Lester Burrow, Michael Moore II, who is also a writer, and and, the, and those guys know each other. A uh, corporate uh, Simpkins. I was in grad school at UMass, and uh, his son, who's a medical doctor, was at Amherst College. So mm -hmm. I, I know small the son. World. Yeah. Small world. Look at small so, world. Small. Uh, I, there, there's another question that came up in the chat. I want to hit it real quick. If somebody could just give us, uh, we've mentioned SNCC a number of times, but one of the audience members said, can you tell me a little bit more about SNCC uh, and its role in the civil rights slash voting movement? SNCC. Uh, Go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> SNCC was an outgrowth of the student sit-in movement that erupted in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960. What happened was that then Ella Baker, who was then the temporary executive director of SCLC, Martin King's organization, recognized the significance of this eruption of student activism and got $800 from Martin Luther King to wow. bring student activists together at her alma mater, uh, uh, Shaw College, then university now in Raleigh, North Carolina. King wanted a student arm to his organization, SCLC. However, Ms. Baker, as soon as the conference got going, then began to speak to students. And, and there's a whole story that is still poorly told of Ella Baker, uh, she began talking to the students who were gathered for her conference and say, are you really sure you want to be a part of some grown-ups organization? Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to form your own organization. Ms. Baker was 57 years old at the time that she did this, but she'd wow. been out there for years, you know, she's the one who really organized a lot of NAACP chapters in the South when she was the director of Southern branches of the NAACP. She had a long history, maybe the most respected political organizer in the South in her time. Uh, as a result of Miss Baker, I would argue, uh, the gathered students decided to form their own organization and they first formed the Temporary Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and then they found, filed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating. And Ms. Baker's message to us was organize from the bottom up. Yes. Organize at the grassroots. Strong people was one of her famous phrases. Strong, strong people. people don't need strong leaders. No. And, and, and uh, again, if, if, if we had more time, I, I could easily pull out, you know, uh, quotes from her talking to us yes. as young people about uh, organizing. Uh, and uh, the first group of people who left school to become full-time workers for SNCC traveled on Miss Baker's network. She oh. was, so if you were traveling in the South, uh, wanting to do political work, and you went someplace, usually Miss Baker had given you a name and address, and they saw that you were one of Miss Baker's people. And she was Miss Baker to us, remember, Miss she Baker. was in her 50s. Not, she was not Ella for the most part. <laughs> you know, if you, and if you were one of Miss Baker's people, you had a credential. You had a major credential. You were one of Miss Baker's people, and they were going to open up to you. 
Let me uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Cobb. Uh, we are closing in. We only have about three minutes left. Uh, this has been an absolutely amazing discussion with trailblazers, history makers, living legends, and I uh, would love to continue uh, in connection with you both. Uh, there's something I wanted to ask, uh, and we'll talk about it maybe at another point. Um, you kind of touched on it, though, all the different elements of the movement from organizing to communication to uh, the protests and the demonstration and the demands. And um, I think sometimes we see the marching and the, and the protest, but we don't realize all the steps that led up to it and all the steps that came behind it. But I greatly appreciate it. Um, I think Chris is going to come on and maybe give you each uh, 30 seconds to uh, close out. This is the this whole thing is focusing on the importance of voting. Um, but uh, Dr. McLemore, uh, just a close out statement as Chris is coming back in to help us close. Uh, uh, I uh, had the, the great pleasure, as I mentioned earlier, to work with uh, Ms. Baker in, in D.C. back in 1964. I worked out of the National Office of the Freedom Democratic Party, and Ms. Baker was the person who was head of that office. Uh, so I had the pleasure of working with her in, in D.C. and the pleasure of of course, bringing her to Atlantic City prior to the Freedom Democratic Party, the National Convention. So I, I had uh, this pleasure working with uh, Ms. Ms. Baker around the Freedom Democratic Party. And of course, the Freedom Democratic Party was around organizing and politics and the politics of, of Mississippi, getting people registered uh, to vote. Now, we haven't really talked about childish freedom schools and all of that, but clearly the legacy of the Freedom Democratic Party is that we have the highest number of black elected officials yes. in Mississippi of any state in the union. And you have to go back to the work of the Freedom Democratic Party and the work of, uh, of Meg Evers. Charlie mentioned network. And just think when the snake people came to Mississippi in 1961, Meg Evers started developing that network in 1954, even prior to that. So SNCC took advantage of E.W. Steptoe that Charlie mentioned, Amzie Moore that Charlie mentioned, Aaron Henry that Charlie mentioned. All of these people were officials in the NAACP before SNCC started to organize in Mississippi. So uh, that, that networking piece was so important and that network is still in place today because clearly without that network, we wouldn't have the highest number of black elected officials of any state in the, in the country. Thank you again, Dr. McLemore. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Uh, Chris, I, I see you here. I know we're uh, closing in on the end of this segment. I appreciate the opportunity for Humanities Nebraska to uh, facilitate today. I want to turn it back to Chris. I'm not sure if we have time for Mr. Cobb to close out, but Chris, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. And yeah, Doc, uh, Mr. Cobb, yeah, if you have any closing thoughts, be, please feel free to share. It's, we're just so grateful to both of you. I would like to bring, there's a name, there are lots of names that were critical to the movement that have sort of vanished uh, from the canon. And because I just was writing about him a couple of hours ago, I want to bring up uh, a quote from Howard Thurman a great, the great theologian. Uh, uh, he, he was Dean of Marsh Chapel at B Boston University, the, the first black Dean of any predominantly white institution. And uh, his classic 1949 book, Jesus and the Disinherited, influenced a whole generation of ministers, including Martin Luther King, who was rarely without a copy in his <laughs> pocket. Uh, and, uh, He gave a eulogy for a woman named uh, Juliet Derricott, who was an educator, former Dean of Women at Fisk University, uh, who uh, died far too early, age of 34. Mm. And she was in an accident, traffic accident, and was critically injured. This is in 1931, and a whites only hospital near where the accident took place. Uh, refused to admit her. Uh, Reverend Thurman uh, gave the eulogy at her funeral, and I and I'm just going to give a couple of lines of it. We don't have time to read the whole, go into the whole eulogy, but I think this part of it is extremely relevant today. He said, "There is work to be done, and ghosts will drive us on." 
This is an unfinished world and she has left an unfinished task. Who will take it up? It's Howard Thurman in 1931. Those are my last words, concluding words. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. I'm so glad you shared that. That um, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you both. Uh, you know, it's a, a blessing to hear from you from Nebraska, way out here in Nebraska, um, feeling far away geographically and probably climate-wise. But um, but our connections as humans is what's important to all the state humanities councils and and our work. Uh, Dr. Mecklemore, appreciate your service with the Mississippi Humanities Council previously and the Federation of State Humanities Councils. Uh, Esther McIntosh sends her, her love to you. Oh, uh, wonderful. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and just, it's been just, uh, we really appreciate having you. And, and Willie, thank you again for moderating this uh, program uh, today. Um, I just have a few closing comments real quick. One is um, we, are, we have book and DVD book and DVD drawings that we're doing throughout this series. And you can find that on our website at humanitiesnebraska.org. And the first uh, winner is Tessa Wedberg. And Tessa, last week we had the McLemore sisters from Alabama and, uh, and Linda Lowry Blackman um, wrote this book, um, Turning 15 on the Road to Freedom, My Story of the 1965 Selma Voting Rights March. And we're giving away a copy of her book to Tessa Wedberg. So that will be headed her way. Next week, we have a program um, at one o'clock central on February 24th uh, with uh, Marth Professor Martha Jones on Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. And that will be moderated by Professor Jennifer Harbour at UNO, who teaches on, on that book as well. Willie and I are conspiring on another program to get into the mix. So hopefully there will be more. And then in, in, into March, we'll continue our valuing, valuing the vote series. Um, Humanities Nebraska is a statewide nonprofit, you know, with the mission of ex helping Nebraskans explore what connects us and makes us human. And, and that is possible through our support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, private donations, the state of Nebraska, the Nebraska Cultural Endowment, uh, people like you uh, who are tuning in. So thank you all for your support of the humanities. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. And I think that concludes this for today. And just, I hope our paths cross again. And thank you again for your time. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Mecklemore, it was nice to see Esther pop up. I forgot that you had served on the Federation board. Yes, so. I did. And, and yeah. Please give her my regards. Tell I said hello, I, please. <laughs>